Hey everyone, Jeff here from Films at Home. Thanks for coming back to the Films at Home podcast here for episode two. Now in today's episode, we have our first guest on the show. And since this guy was the first one who gave me a chance on his YouTube channel, I gave him the first guest spot on my podcast. Today we're talking to Heath from Serial at Midnight. He runs the website serialatmidnight.com where he does a ton of written physical media and movie reviews, but he also has the YouTube channel Serial at Midnight where he just recently passed 25,000 subscribers. So let's get him some more subscribers. If you like physical media and boutique stuff, if you really like sort of the nitty gritty of cinema and film history, Heath knows more about this stuff. He's like Tarantino in a video story. Store. He knows everything when it comes to movies and has such a unique mind for cinema and such a unique collection. So if you're looking for that sort of thing outside of the mainstream, he is your guy. I watch his channel religiously. I love seeing new movies and new releases on physical media that I had no idea about. Usually he's the first one who tells me. So go check out his stuff. I'll leave all the links in the description to Serial at Midnight. He's also on Twitter, Instagram, all the different social platforms, as well as that YouTube channel but you can find everything at serial at midnight.com so super thankful to have heath on the show here i love talking to this guy we went for about an hour which is about 15 or 20 minutes longer than usually i, I would want to go for the podcast but it was well worth it and i think you guys will enjoy the conversation so get settled enjoy our little conversation here for the next hour and hope you guys subscribe and follow along for more episodes like this now let's jump right into heath's interview I want to know why you still collect physical media in 2022. <laughs> Just kidding. That's your first episode, right? Did you listen to my first episode? No, but I saw it went up. I've been working all day, but I saw it went up. To be fair, we are only recording this six hours after it went live. So yeah. you have you have plenty of time. I guess you're not my first listener, but you'll at least be maybe a day one guy. Um, but yeah, that was that was exciting. Episode one went up. New podcast. So trying something new and you are the first guest so well thank you very much what that's awesome. a huge deal um had to have you on first because honestly you were the i think you were the first person who was like hey i like what you're doing come on my channel and let's do an interview so that's right i forgot about that yeah because you hadn't done anything like that before had you i i had not i've been in my sort of like little cocoon and was doing my own thing and didn't know if anybody cared or was watching. I was just kind of doing it for fun. And then, um, yeah, you were like, hey, people want to talk to you. Like, come on here and do an interview. So I was like, all right. And I really haven't done many since. I think I've only done one more. So um, it's still a very exclusive interview for you at Serial at Midnight. There you go. Well, thank you for reciprocating. And we talked about that. I remember we talked about that. We were, I was like, you know, they're just going to want to know. I was like, you got to be careful with interviews because they just want to ask you the same five questions over and over. And that's still, I don't know if that's been your experience, but that's still fairly true for me. What's your favorite movie? What's your favorite item from your collection? And, you know, like how many times can you answer? You can lie. You can start making stuff up. But that's not. Well, and, and sometimes I find myself changing the answer. So it's like, yeah, what's my favorite movie? I don't know. For this interviewer, it's, it's Jaws, but everybody knows it's Jaws. So like anybody who watches the channel knows that. So I'll switch it up and see if anybody notices. Yeah. And, you know, by changing your answers, I don't know. It's you're keeping people on their toes, but also maybe you're like me with like, if you try to answer that question, honestly, maybe you have a different answer from day to day. Maybe things aren't the same. If you people that say like, you know, sometimes people on my channel will be like, I, I like the same thing that I like today. And I liked it yesterday and I like it tomorrow and it never changes. And I'm like, Hmm, that's interesting. So you're not, nothing's changing. Everything's just stagnant. It stays the same all the time. So I don't know, teach their own. But my answer is like, I have a really hard time with favorites list because it's constantly in flux. And uh, I like certain things more the older I get. I like certain things less the older I get. So, yeah. No, I, I feel that. Because like, I, if you ask me in the middle of July in a New England summer, hey, what's your favorite movie? It's going to be Jaws every time. Because I'm like, I'm like in that world. Like I vacation on the Cape in the summer for a week and I just like live the Jaws life. And 
like that's going to be it. But I don't know if you ask me in the winter and it's like, I haven't sniffed the beach in six months, you know, maybe it's not my favorite movie at that moment. It's always going to be there, but you're right. I mean, it, my mood changes. I've changed with age for sure. I would have told you training day, like 10 years ago, like that was it. That was the movie for me, Denzel in training day. And then I got older and I was like, no, wait, like Jaws isn't just a goofy shark movie. Like this is really a legitimately great movie that I love. Yeah. So, it's, yeah, it's my tastes have definitely changed. Great performances, great. I mean, that, yeah, it's just put together masterfully. Totally. Yeah. No, you can't beat it. Um, but yeah, I, every summer, that'll be, that's my go to. Um, I just watched this movie, Tentacles, that came out from Kino Lorber recently. And it's an Italian, it's, well, it's not Italian, but it's made by like a Greek director and Italian crew and stuff like that. And it's uh, very much, it's from 1977 and it's very much Jaws exploitation. And it's the same structure as two guys on the boat at the end and they got to go kill the octopus. But it's it's like, well, it's it's not good, but there's something about it that's like charming and the music is really good. It's like got this great, like, uh, that's the thing about Italian movies and some of those Euro movies is they're not always great, but the music, the scores are amazing. They synthesize their stuff like, dark, 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 dark. like yeah, <laughs> I'm feeling this. Yeah. Like Free Carpenter kind of stuff too. Right. Yeah, I was gonna say that that was that's very John Carpenter esque, but that's even before you came around. So, you know, he probably took some from that. But I haven't heard of that. Was was it Tentacles? Tentacles, yeah. And I think the original, I think the Italian title is like Tentacoli or something like that. It just came out. I gotta um, add that because I I have like my Jaws collection, but I also have the Jaws like knockoff exploitation collection. The Jaws exploitation stuff. Well, I'm not recommending it, but I think you'll probably get a kick out of it. Since it's, it's... if it's in that s similar sort of genre, yeah, I'll love it. I think they're hilarious. So that's a Kino release. See, you you know so much more about the. I feel like yeah, I've got great. I've got these mainstream 4K reviews and stuff, but I watch your channel and I go, oh my, I am missing so many of these cool like boutique movies that I just don't even realize come out and you know so much about them and i'm just like where does that come from like how like is that just institutional knowledge from 30 40 years of doing this i think it well i think it's that yeah i think for sure that it's like where i'm at because you know i come from the same place you're coming from which is like you know you you start studying what's popular and you, you grow up you, you love what you grow up with and then you reach a point and um you're like okay i've seen jaws a whole lot of times now what else is out there and you start to venture out and they're like go check this out and then because i'm uh, kind of middle aged now i am old enough to have been i was thinking about this the other day you know we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of the of the dvd format and like I was an adult when that came out. Like, it's hard to think, but I was like in college when DVD hit. And so I would go, you know, uh, I had been a VHS guy. Laser discs were too expensive for me, but I was a VHS guy. And uh, when DVD came out, I was like, oh man, I have a paycheck. They're like, they like 25 bucks each in 98 money, you know, or 97 money. And so that was a lot, but you weren't getting all all the stuff we're getting now. And so you would really study this stuff. I would watch the DVD came out for reservoir dogs and Pulp Fiction. And I would watch those with a notebook and I would take notes on the commentaries and I would take notes on like the interviews and stuff. I'd be like, okay, Quentin Tarantino recommends this kind of film. So fast forward 25 years and this is just where I'm at. You know, I'm just like, okay, I've, you, you just build it. Like you watch, you know, you watch John Carpenter and you're like, well, who influenced John Carpenter? And then there you are. So, but I'm still discovering stuff all the time because we're living in something. We're living in a moment right now. Is, I've never seen anything like this before where every company, every studio is just like, get it out, get it out there. Let's get this stuff monetized and uh, independent companies. And the premise for, you know, may I say that the initial premise for this video, when we first started talking about it, was going to be like lost movies. And I started, I was like, there are for sure some lost movies. But the more I started thinking about it, I was like, Ed, not nearly as many as they used to be. You and I did a crossover. What was that? Like two, two years ago, maybe it was, it doesn't feel like it was that long ago. And I, we had, we picked five movies that need Blu-rays. And I think four of my five are out now there. They came out. 
That's pretty good. Um, I'd have to go back and check. I, I would bet mine are probably the same. Unless I had Panic Room on there because that's just a notorious one that's apparently never going to come to Blu-ray or 4K. <laughs> Keeps getting delayed. Um, I think I had that on there. But I, 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 bet, I bet you're right. Like the last two years, especially, it feels like everyone's ramped up. Like Kino has been putting out a ton of stuff. Arrow Video has been cranking. Then you have like MVD Entertainment did their own thing in the U S and they have so many of these like obscure, like straight to VHS and like lesser known B movies. Um, and then one that I've been loving lately and I've seen them on your channel is, is imprint because they're doing, I mean, they're all the way over in Australia, but like, they're not that hard to get. They make them pretty accessible even in the U S and they have so many movies that they've put out for the first time on Blu-ray that nobody else has in the world. So I've been loving their stuff. Yeah, I noticed that some of their stuff is starting to pop up over here, even though it's like it's a little delayed. It's not everything. They're still and that's weird. There's a conversation conversation there too. Like Paramount is Paramount specifically is licensing things to imprint out of Australia that they haven't put out here and they're not doing anything with. And I'm like, why are you like you're here in America, the studio is here in America, your distribution is here in America. And you're licensing these things out so we can still get it, I guess we can still import it. And it's great for Australia and it's great for us. And, you know, I'm covering a lot of that stuff, but I'm just wondering like, what's the, does it not sell domestically? I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Cause they should be able to fit those types of, t I mean, they have Paramount presents going, right? So like, that's a similar type of thing that imprint is doing with the Paramount titles is sort of like this not not quite premium but like there's better packaging it's a little bit more collector focused it has your special features it's got some cool artwork like they're clearly catering towards the collector with paramount presents just like imprint is so i, ha I haven't been able to figure that one out because it's it's really odd and i don't know if it's just like maybe it's harder to get people like maybe they want to sell the rights to united states boutique companies and it's just harder to do here because i i noticed one that i've been wanting for a while is fire in the sky and i have i finally got the imprint version and then like two days ago shout factory released you know that they're coming out with the u.s blu-ray but i'm like well what what took so long because that feels like a no-brainer that would be of interest to that crowd so it like why did imprint get it first you. totally absolutely yeah I, I don't know i don't know what's going on there um it is really interesting that like because I hear from a lot of people in Australia and New Zealand, too, that tell me it's getting really hard to get physical media there. But they've got one of these great new emerging labels coming out of Australia, but they're having a hard time like getting mainstream stuff. So it's really odd. It, well, yeah, and they, they do have JB Hi-Fi there, and they can still just walk into a JB Hi-Fi and be like, I'm looking for this, and it's probably going to be there. The amount of stuff that Australians tell me they just walk into a store. I'm like, I can't walk into a Best Buy and get that or a, a Target or whatever. Most of the stuff, and we, I'm not, com I'm not really comparing because we have it pretty great here. We just have to mail order, you know, you just have to order what you want through the mail. But they seem to have, I don't know, it's probably fewer and far. And Australia is huge too. So I'm sure that like not everybody can just drive up to a JB Hi Fi. But uh, it's interesting that, um, yeah, the, the distribution for this stuff. Go back to Paramount. You notice like they do have the Paramount Presents line, which is cool, but then they'll quietly sneak out other releases that aren't part of that, like Night at the Roxbury for like fourteen ninety nine or something like twelve. I think it was twelve ninety nine. I'm like, what? Why? What's going on with that? I think that that was I think that was Paramount. Yeah, they did. Um, I grabbed a few of the. There was they came out with Small Soldiers. They did Good Burger. They did Night at the Roxbury. They kind of like quietly released a bunch of catalog type but those are like i mean those have a following like i i i grabbed them all for sure i was like yes i want these in hd like absolutely respect small soldiers like i grew up on that one and good burger like forget it Th that was childhood for me so um but yeah they kind of like underplayed it like it just sort of it came out i made videos on it on those two and i usually don't do a ton of like blu-ray specific reviews i'll do collection updates and talk about them but i specifically reviewed those two because i wanted people to know that they came out i felt like they got like way underappreciated 
Yeah, seriously. You're right. They just kind of pop up on Amazon one day for $14.99. You'll never see them in stores. And it's like most people probably don't even know they're out there. But, I mean, we do have it pretty good, though. Like, I'm really happy to see all these new labels. Imprint is one, but, like, the, the work, even, like, the Vestron video label that still continues on and is putting out some cool releases. I mean, the, there's there's a ton of cool stuff happening right now. It's just becoming more niche, which is... I've kind of been talking about that for a few years. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but, like, physical media it's not that 50 million people are going to go buy the matrix on dvd anymore it's like you've got to cater to this niche market and some of these boutique labels are are killing it i think and i see that as like the future for where this is all going yeah no i agree with that 100 that's exactly what's happening i was here before this was huge again going back to when dvd was brand new it was a super niche thing you could go find it at Circuit City or Best Buy. I used to go to like Circuit City, rest in peace, Circuit City, but they used to be great for DVDs. And, uh, and you know, you'd go buy these. I remember go, like shopping Circuit City for Saving Private Ryan on DVD. And it's just like, yes, but nobody else is going to do that. It's not like it was a super common thing to do. And then over the years, it gets more and more adopted and the prices come down. And then Walmart starts to have like aisle upon aisle of this stuff. Best Buy's got this huge section and that can't last because it, it was, it's a niche thing. You know, the movie, people are always going to go whatever's cheap, easy to get. And with streaming in the picture, that's going to all, that's, that's it now is that's your market leader. I don't think there's a war between streaming and physical media. Cause if there was a war, then I'm sorry, physical media lost that years ago. There are, you know, probably, I don't know. I'm not going to get it specifically into numbers, but there's not that much of us compared to like Disney plus that has a hundred plus a hundred million plus subscribers. There's not even a million of us of, of these, you know, there's probably where your channel's coming up on a hundred thousand. Right. And you're probably the biggest that there is out there. So let's say that that's the market, right? There's not millions of us doing this. So it's just going back to this niche thing and these labels, I can tell you without being specific that, they're doing better than ever. They're having like the best profits that they've ever had. So yeah, like Universal's not selling a lot of this stuff themselves, but they're licensing it to Aquino Lorber or they're sending it to some people are sending it to Australia. Um, but if you want it, you can get it. And so it's not something I just, there's a lot of fear and a lot of worry. And I just don't think that that serves us because we don't need to be worried. It's here. And I don't really think it's going anywhere either. There's money to be made. It's still a multi-billion dollar industry. So why worry? Just enjoy it. Yeah, no, I actually, I, I talked through that in my, in the first podcast episode, I, when I was talking about like why I collect, how I think the future of physical. And I said, like, there is this mantra sometimes. And I, and I fell into it when I started too, where I was like, streaming sucks, kill streaming. If you stream, you're the worst. You need to buy everything on disc. And I'm just like, a that's not realistic b like i am going to stream things from time to time for convenience or because i want to watch obi-wan on disney plus and not miss that and i know it's not getting a blu-ray release i mean it's been four years since the mandalorian came out so you know i consume content that way but then of course like i want to own it and i have the nostalgia for blockbuster and i want to own discs and put them on my shelf and have a collection but it's not like it's not like you're you're one side or the other. It's like the, the reality is in order for this to keep growing and maintain is like most people are going to be somewhere in the middle. You're going to stream some stuff. You're going to buy your favorites. Not everyone's going to have the collection you and I have. Like that's unrealistic. But even if people just start buying their favorites and realize that there's some really cool stuff coming out lately, that's a huge win because those people were not just, you know, going out and buying random ABC movie on a Tuesday. Uh, so I, so I like where that's heading and I think you're, you're totally right with like the labels are loving it because it, it used to be so hard for them to get a license to release a universal or a paramount movie. Like that was theirs paramount released those. And like, they must just be loving this like new era of licensing things out to the, to the labels that really get collectors and have the time and effort that they want to put into these things. Um, cause they do, I mean, no, 
nothing against any of the major studios, but like I would take an Arrow or a Kino or a Shout Factory release any day over standard Warner Brothers Blu-ray, like all the time. I would I, I would love for them to do everything, and I think that's where it's headed. Is like eventually i i hope like disney does this with their live action and fox and like all that stuff like just just ship it out let the people who care about it do it and get it off your plate you still make money but let them you know really take good care of it well yeah and i say like i don't i don't really think fear needs to be a motivator for us but then then there's the there's the fox disney thing like disney bought fox and it's just behind a wall they're some of that stuff's on streaming, but a lot of those times, and they've they've monetized some of that stuff. You think of the big hits, like the 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 alien stuff and the predator stuff. Like they get it out there, but there's a huge thousands of movies that are just currently off the table right now. And I'm like, what are you guys going to do with this? I don't even know if they know what they're going to do with it. it. It kind of, and then the whole MGM thing with Amazon recently. I'm like, I bet that was about streaming. I bet that was about beefing up, you know, their um, their catalog for to bolster competition against Netflix or Hulu specifically Hulu um, discs are not a concern for that, but I'm just concerned about stuff getting lost, you know, because thankfully I've got a lot of uh, like, I'm a big film noir fan. Fox put out a ton of film noir and I've got a complete collection of Fox film noir, but they're DVDs. And I'm like, so many of those could really use an upgrade. And if they keep hiding these behind this wall, then these movies are being lost. Nobody made a movie for it to just sit in a vault or I guess if it's on a streaming platform or if it's on iTunes, then it's not technically off the table, but yeah. But I mean, you know, even, but even like Disney plus in the U S isn't putting what anything that's over anything rated R is like not on the platform. I think so. It's like, you know, they're, (laughs) there goes half the Fox catalog. Um, yeah. You know, like none of that stuff is, is actually available right now. And that, that is, that is the scary part of it. I don't fear like, I don't fear streaming as a service or as a, like an industry. I fear Disney scooping up Fox and then Disney scooping up Lionsgate and then Disney scooping Warner and Amazon buying Paramount. And all of a sudden you've got Disney and Amazon and that and then it, apple buys disney and then yeah just, and yeah. then apple and then one of them buys amc theaters and it's like okay we have no choices anymore yeah we have what two companies tell us they want us to watch that's what scares me and, yeah. you're, and you're totally right like the the monopolies that are being built are a little terrifying until i, I know and the, the people that are supposed to be preventing this stuff from happening are like seems legit i'm like yeah. what well, no you it's don't fight the mouse, all. right? Nobody wants to fight the mouse. Yeah. Well, there's that. And then, I mean, it really does seem like in a few, there, like maybe there's five companies that own everything now. And like in the next five years, there'll be three companies that own everything. And then what happens after that? You look at movie history, the last hundred years of movie history, you had all these studios that would compete and competition makes things better because everybody wanted, you know, Warner Brothers wanted to compete with, you know, you got, you got the majors, you got the minors, and then you've got the poverty row stuff. Everybody's trying to, they got their little niche. Now there's the whole side thing about how some of the studios own the theaters. They had a monopoly on the theaters, which was so that I've already kind of broken my example here, but let's go with me and just say that you've got all this competition, right? Competition is good for business. It's good for making a better product, a cheaper product, something that gets people in. When you take competition off the table, like these actors have less places to go the directors have less, you know, like I know people that are trying to make movies and it's never been harder for people to make movies because if you don't have like an eight episode Netflix series under your belt already, nobody wants to give you a movie. But back in the nineties, which like in some way, like for me, it doesn't seem like that long ago, but in terms of the industry, that might as well have been like 1925 or something. But back in like when Tarantino's cutting his teeth and coming out and, uh, you know, uh, I think about the movies like Heat and I think about, uh, I mean, there's just like this golden age of like creator stuff, like written and directed by so-and-so and people that um, were fresh out of film school were getting shots that nobody, like maybe the people got a shot like that in the 70s when the new Hollywood system was being built. But like you can't get anything made now. And if they do, 
I, I also know people that are like, I have this great idea for a movie. I'm having a hard time getting financing. Netflix said they can do this movie as an eight episode series, but it's not an eight episode series. It's a movie. And so that's, it's all about clicks now too, which is a problem because I'm sorry. I there is a purity to a film. There is a purity to a 90 minute movie versus, you know, six hours over eight episodes. That's a whole different thing. You have to write differently for that. And if you don't have the idea for, if you conceive it that way, how in the world do you adapt your idea into eight episodes without dilution? So we end up with a lot of dilution. Yeah. No, I definitely. I mean, you're totally right. I don't know how like. I don't know if you'd get Tarantino in 2022. You wouldn't get Kevin Smith shooting a movie at his convenience, you know, the convenience store. You wouldn't get Richard Linklater. Like you wouldn't, get, you wouldn't get these guys. They don't, they, they'd be making, I guess, Netflix shows maybe if they were lucky, but you're right. Cause I, and I've noticed this trend in Netflix shows where it was like, okay, an episode used to be 40 minutes, right? You take no commercials. It's an hour long show. So it's 40, 45 minutes. And I'm watching shows lately and I'm like, this episode is an hour and 25 minutes. That is, that's a movie. Yeah. Like that's one episode of a nine part series. You're really asking a lot for me. And that's part of my issue with like, I'm so burnt out on the Marvel stuff. Like I like it and I wish it was more condensed because I just can't. I committed 10 hours to WandaVision and it's like, and now next month you want me to commit 10 hours to Falcon and Winter Soldier. And then I've got, you know, it's just like moon nights come out. Give me 10 more hours. And it's just like, couldn't those all just be an hour and a half, two hour long movies. That would be probably decent, entertaining popcorn flicks, but like I'm skipping them. Cause I just don't have, I mean, I got a, I got a seven month old baby here. Find me an hour and a half to watch a, a movie. That's, that's enough find me 10 hours to watch a whole show i mean it could take me a month to do it's just not possible it's just it's almost like too much content and you're right because the episodes are so oversaturated and just like that there's just there's no real content in them sometimes it's just it's just runtime and that's what's killing me and that's yeah. i mean that's why i like i've been going back and discovering a lot more of the stuff that that's older versus watching a lot of newer stuff but it's also why i stick by and i'm like the a24 neon films fanboy because i'm like at least they're doing original stuff that is different and they're giving people a chance and it's not just franchise like yeah. i know I, I talked to my dad and he'd be like you don't watch any movies because you don't see any mainstream stuff and i'm like well no i could name you like 20 movies that i've watched last year that were excellent but like you and everyone else didn't hear about them because they were just these indie flicks that don't have $50 million marketing budgets, but they were way better than anything that came out last year. And people laugh at me, but like, it's true. It's yeah. that's all that's really left though, is like those two companies. I don't even know if I could name another one that's really doing a ton of independent type stuff like that. Yeah. I'm not sure. A24 is doing great. Even, like love it or hate it. And people do hate it. Uh, it's not cookie cutter. It's not just like cranking out. People love this. It's it's risky stuff, and you gotta love it. Well, you got you gotta appreciate it. You don't have to love it, but you should appreciate it because it's yeah. Not there, like, there's there's yeah. some misses in there, but at least they're trying. Like, yeah. and you're giving people a shot. A lot of those directors, at least with their first movies with them, are are new. They wrote something, and they're they're at least trying to be original, which I appreciate. Yeah, I do too. Well said. So, yeah, it's just, it's been tough, but that really is why I've been loving the boutique, the Blu-ray in, in 4K stuff that's coming out, because I'm discovering all this great stuff that I, I just missed. I grew up in the 90s, so, like, DVD was, like, the, I had VHS tapes for sure. But like DVD was when I was like, oh, okay, like these are movies. I got surround sound. My dad bought a surround sound system. It was like, this is a movie. And so I, I am like way oversaturated in my knowledge from like 1995 to like present day. And before that, I'm like, oh man, there are hundreds of great movies that I have not watched yet. I'm literally trying to catch up. Well, see, that's where I'm at because I'm a 93 and before guy. I think that Jurassic, but this is, I say this, Jurassic Park 
was like a line in the sand and every, nothing was the same after Jurassic Park. And I love Jurassic Park. It's not a criticism, but that ushered in this whole new era of like, we can do it with CGI. We can have these huge budgets. We can, you know, like it, it was this very clear line in the sand and you look at what came after that. And, uh, and then you look at what came before that. And so for me, and it's just my age. And when I grew up, like I'm really good with 93 and before. Cause I, like I talk about growing up in the eighties and stuff. And like, you would see the Ninja Turtles would be on one channel. A Humphrey Bogart movie movie would be on another channel. Like, Mr. Ed, the talking horse show would be on an, like all this stuff was on the same dial at the same time. And there was no separation of like, this is old. Like, cause when I grew up, you know, it, they needed to fill time on television. There was not enough, like, it's hard to imagine now. Cause there's so much TV everywhere, like a bazillion channels and streaming networks. But at that time there was not enough TV. So they were showing old shows and they were showing old movies and stuff just to kind of fill that airtime and the discovery. And so that's why I love fifties monster movies. And that's why I love like cheesy sitcoms from the fifties and sixties. Cause like Nickelodeon when I was a kid and Nick at night when I was a kid, that's what was cool. And it wasn't like it was ironic. It was like, no, no, like the monkeys or there was this uh, show called uh, Lancelot link. He was a, he was a secret agent chimpanzee and it was the coolest thing ever. Cause it was a real, it was like a real, it was not a cartoon. It was an actual chimpanzee. That was a secret agent. And like, that's lost. Now it's not lost. Cause I have it on DVD, physical media ding. But you know, like who's talking about that right now, but I got to grow up in this great time. And so I always find it more rewarding when I look back than when I, like I look around now and it's just overwhelming and there's such good stuff coming out if you can find it, but it's so it's so noisy and like you sign on to Twitter and everybody's yelling their stuff at you. And I'm like, I'm just going to go watch this thing from 1954 that I've never seen before. And I'm probably going to have a great time. <laughs> yeah, no. And that's, that's really like what I've been trying to do. I guess maybe being stuck at home with COVID and everything for a while kind of turned that because there weren't these new shiny releases coming out that I was like, I got to go see this and that. And I started to dive back into more of like that back catalog and found a bunch of stuff that I love, but I think you're totally right because it's, it's clicks and it's views and it's like, what is, what's trending today? And nobody cares about, you know, this great movie from the forties or fifties. Like I watched the night of the hunter the other day and it's like, that's oh. a, that was the first time I'd ever watched it. Um, like, that's an awesome movie. I'm yeah. like, I'm like, who is this actor? He is incredible. Like, Robert Meacham, is that who you're talking about? Yeah, and so so I went out and bought the Friends of Eddie Coyle, the Criterion Blu-ray, because he's. I was like, I need more of this guy's stuff because that's just like I, I'd never seen anything before, and that movie's awesome. And I'd heard people talk about it, yeah, in most mostly in like a horror context because of usually on like a horror movie show or TV show. I think like Eli Roth or Tarantino talked about it being an influence. And I was like, all right, I got to watch this thing. And it's awesome. But like, go try to tell some 15 year old kid to watch that movie. And it's like, good luck. Like they're going to get five minutes in and be like, this is the most boring thing that I've ever seen in my life. And where's the constant action? And you know, when's the, when's the next episode? And it's funny. Cause I've, I've jumped into TikTok, and I don't know if you've done that yet, but so yeah, we can talk about it. Go ahead. I so I started like a year ago. I was like, this is not for me, and it's so funny because it's the demographic on there. They find out you have a collection, and they're like, "Show me SpongeBob, show me Nickelodeon, show me you know, show me Small Soldiers or Good Burger." It's a lot of like millennial age, but also a lot of younger kids. And I'll show a movie from the 40s or 50s or talk about like, hey, these are my favorite classic movies. And people are like, never heard of them. Don't care about this. Yep. And I, it's such a it's such a shame. But I'm also kind of glad I jumped in there because I'm hoping maybe I'm spreading the word a little bit about stuff that they've totally overlooked. Maybe so. You fight in the good fight. I'm trying to fight for TikTok fight. like six months ago. And I didn't do anything with it because I was just overwhelmed. Because look, it's let's be honest. It's not for me. It's like, no, I can be goofy. I can be really silly. And I need to, I need to tap into that aspect for TikTok. Cause that's all that it's, that's what they want. But actually what the kids want, they want the goofy. 
but so like I, I so I had to I lost my screen name. They're just I guess they gave it to somebody else. I went to sign back in like six months later and I couldn't sign in and I was like, well crap. So I re I opened another account and I've posted twice and they're doing okay. But you know you can't get any you're not gonna get any traction on two posts. But I'm like I don't. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I'm posting a video five days a week, sometimes six, sometimes seven days a week. Like, uh, do I have to? Do I really have to go like pull my pants down and do something really silly for TikTok? You know, but I should because it it all matters. Like what we're talking about, like the movies, the art of like it all matters, and they're not. Oh man, you know, you talking about like they're not interested or whatever. I just watched this movie that just came out from Flickr Alley called The Whistle at Eaton Falls. And it's been, now that's a lost movie. Speaking about lost movies, it had been lost for decades, just completely poof, just nowhere to be found on any, I don't even know if I got a video cassette release back in the day. And it's got uh, um, Lloyd Bridges, Jeff Bridges' dad in it, and Bo, Jeff and Bo's dad. And uh, it's this like, it's 1951 and it's basically applied economics. And on paper, you're like, that sounds boring, but it's the most uncomfortable I've been watching a movie. Like forget horror. This movie made me so uncomfortable because it's like this guy, there's a, it's a small town in New Hampshire. They've got this factory that's employing most of the people in the town and the business is slowing down. Times are tough and business is slowing down. So the factory is going to have to close. And the, the, comp- the people they manufacture for are taking their business south because it's cheaper. And so the four, the guy that runs the company, he's like, listen, we're going to have to let – we can let half of you guys go or the factory closes down. And so Lloyd Bridges is like, I can save it. No, no, I can save it. So he gets really involved and he ends – the guy – the boss ends up dying. And so now it's Lloyd Bridges as the boss. He gets appointed the new boss. And he has this realization, I have to close half the factory or I have to, or I have to lay off half the people, or I have to close the factory. There is no way around it. It's simple economics. We got to sell these buttons for forty-five cents, but it costs us forty-eight cents to make them. What do I do? And then the town is like, "You ruined our jobs. You ruined our lives. Hey, we hate you." And they like, well, they want to kill him, and they get violent. And he's like, "We're living this today, you know, like this is ripped from the headline stuff." It was so uncomfortable because I'm like, "This is like, this is not escapism. This is like uh, people's lives," and what do you do when there are no answers? We're like, yeah, well, there's no more business. I'm sorry. We have to close. And it's like, no one is going, you, you, you say that to some kid, right? Even somebody who's like 30 years old, they're like, I don't want to watch that, but it's so compelling and it's so human and so relatable. There's just something about it. And, uh, hopefully we can get the word out. I just, I got the word out on the whistle at Eaton Falls. There you there. go. It's out there, but yeah. that is what I'm, I mean, I, and I fully remember being 14 or 15 and I would not have watched night of the hunter. I would have watched like fast and furious, like six or something. And like, that would have been it. So my, my hope is just like plant, plant seeds. I know I'm not going to change a 15 year old's mind, but you know, when you're 20 something, I actually like going to college was a big one for me. Like then you start to experience and it, like talk to different people who have different experiences and different backgrounds who have watched this or watched that. And, and you start to share that. I, I watched a bunch of movies for the first time. Like my freshman year in college, I had never even heard of the big Lebowski. And someone was like, you got to watch this movie. This is a, it's a hilarious movie. I mean, now it's like one of my favorites. And I remember watching it on like a 24 inch TV in a dorm room for the first time. And that, that's, that's when I, you know, I'm hopeful that, with TikTok and with social media, there's so much negative, but could there be positive where we actually introduce people's experiences that are different to other people so that these yeah. movies don't get lost? Cause that's, that's like one of my biggest fears is in, in that's, it goes back to the Disney Fox thing. Like is everything Fox did from what the 19, when did they start? Thirties, forties. I don't know when Fox started, but like, is that, I'll look it up while you're is that gone now? Like, have we just lost 80 years of adult movies because we want to focus on the Home Alones in the group and and not all these film noirs, like you said? Like, yeah, that's that's scary. And that's, that is scary. You know what? They, you've hit on something else. And I know we don't have like 
17 hours to talk about this, but the juvenilization of, uh, of modern cinema and it's not new, but like I, I read this book about how um, it was called teenagers and teen picks, the juvenilization of 1950s cinema. And it makes a really strong, comp- it's written by a professor and it makes a really compelling point that the 1950s, you got all these baby boomer kids after world war two, they're the first generation that has disposable income and their own cars. And they're the ones that are going to the movies and ever since the 1950s, it's the teenagers that go to the movies and they're the ones that are supporting the new product and the older people just stay at home. But and so that's always been the case, but you look at what's happening right now and it's like even worse than that because it's so hard to find. Now we do have our A24, but it's so hard to find movies that aren't part of a franchise that aren't made for 14 year olds because most stuff is made for 14 year olds and that has some budget and goal. I'm thinking about like everybody loves the Shawshank Redemption and everybody loves LA confidential, but sometimes they still try to make movies like that and people don't go to see them. Like motherless Brooklyn is that kind of a movie from a few years ago and no, it lost like it tanked. I was like, man, you guys, this was a great movie that nobody showed up to go see. I saw that in an empty theater, but there's a couple of elderly people in front of me in the, in the, in the theater. And so, like, it is our our grown up movies getting lost. It's kind of scary to think about because sometimes it seems like they are. I I definitely, I definitely feel that, and it's like I I also have started to hate the movie theater experience, which sucks yeah. because I love going to see a movie. It's changed, but I like can't walk into an AMC anymore and enjoy myself. I mean, I went to see the Batman, and. I was so distracted the whole time by the by people, people in there and the, the, the phones are out. I mean, there's literally people taking pictures of themselves and Snapchatting and on t- and I'm like, why did you even buy a ticket? Like, why are you here? Um, I would much rather go to like the independent little movie theater. You know, there, there's a couple by me. There's a couple in Boston that are still independent and do really cool things. And I'm just like, I am totally washed out on the AMC showcase cinemas type deal. And I just feel like in the future, I mean, you're totally, it's going to be like this place to just go watch the latest comic book movie. And like these adult movies or serious movies are going to have to find another way to finance and make money. And like, that's, that's where I'm like, hope maybe it's physical media. Maybe you can just, skip the movie theater where you were only going to make $2 million anyway, and put a really great marketing campaign together and just release the movie somewhere. Um, that's a hard sell though, to a, you know, to a director, people want to see their stuff on the big screen. I would, if I was a director, but it is a shame because, you know, Spider-Man's got 59 out of the 60 screens at AMC. So there's no, there's no room for anything else. Like it just, it's not possible and AMC is barely staying afloat as it is by doing that. So like, where's the, where's the breaking point there? Um, it's, it's not a great looking future sometimes for the theater experience. I think. No, I don't think the, I don't know the theaters are ever going to go away, but you're right. What it, what they've had to do to stay afloat is to cater to, and, and the, the, the movie studios are making movies that cater to that experience too. It's just, it's what Scorsese said that people bit his head off over, but like it's theme theme park rides as a movie. And I know that nobody wanted to hear that, but what's what he's saying is like, this is not like my kind of a movie. This is not a Scorsese kind of a movie. These are just experiences. These are just like roller coaster rides in movie form. And that's what people show up for. Um, I guess there is an argument for streaming for that though. Like if you, that streaming is a valid platform to get your stuff out there because you've taken away distribution costs for printing up media and you don't have to mail it to you know there's no supply chain really it's just there one day it's just there so that's an option and uh, that's why streaming is not necessarily satan incarnate uh, right no it, it creates a ton of opportunity it, it is the only way i think you can really get traction right now if you're a young if you don't have connections if you if your dad doesn't work somewhere like or your uncle is a you know, VP of something at Warner brothers, like you kind of have to shoot your stuff and throw it on YouTube and Vimeo and hope somebody sees it and picks it up. And then 
even then your best chance is probably that it ends up on a Netflix or Amazon or Hulu for your first run before they try to hand you the reins for anything bigger. So that, I mean, that is where streaming is super beneficial. It's like indie film. Um, but that's why I hope that they keep, they keep putting out physical discs too, because I think we're here and we're the ones who would support that and actually allow you to make a little bit of money off of your physical release as well. If you can, you know, keep the cost down or find a boutique label that's willing to pay you a little bit to, to license it out. Like that's, that's why I'm hopeful because you don't have to go through Warner Paramount Disney anymore to get your movies on the shelf and get a disc made. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be a crazy, like, like COVID threw everything for a loop with movie theaters and that's been a roller coaster ride. And now it's like, where are we going from here? Cause I still don't think it's all, it's all figured out. The dust hasn't settled. No, it's going to be the next three to five years are going to be very, very interesting indeed. Yeah. And I actually talked about in the last episode too, like when it gets to a point where you can buy a 90 inch TV for two grand, $1,500 and get yourself a, a Dolby Atmos sound bar, like all these, inc- the crazy technology that's come out now. It's like, are people just going to shift to, like, I think home theaters become more of a thing when you can buy a 90 inch TV at a reasonable price. And then I'm hopeful that that brings back physical um, in, in some way or another, because more people are watching movies at home. I think, I think that contributes to part of the traffic that we've all seen in the last couple of years on, on YouTube and the renewed interest in these releases is like people are home. People want to watch things and it's, I shouldn't have to Google where to find a movie, like on what streaming service. Like, let me just take it off my shelf. Yeah. I saw a statistic around the, uh, around the time of the Oscars a couple of weeks ago and uh, 60% of the people that were polled had not been to the movies in the last year. And so they're watching them at home. And then one of the only reasons I go to the movies now for movies like Spider-Man or the Batman or whatever is because I don't want to have it spoiled on the internet before I actually get a chance to see it. Because people are terrible about that too. The common etiquette is gone now. The, the respect of your fellow person in the, in the theater or or on online, that's not news, but like respect, respect is gone. So if you want to see it, you better go. And there's just so much information that even if you try to avoid it, like now you can't, you open Google Chrome on your phone and it throws like 10 news articles at you before you even search for something. And it's like, oh great. And one of them has a spoiler for Spider-Man. <laughs> and it's like, you can't avoid it even if you try to. So I feel you. I went opening weekend for Spider-Man. I went opening weekend for the Batman. Like if it's that big movie that I care about, I'm there opening night. But I've also found myself trying to avoid trailers and things like that lately because i feel like movies are just getting ruined for me before i get to the theater um so there's a bunch of a24 stuff that i've wanted to see haven't been able to get out and see it because it's hard to get a babysitter and just go up to the movies anymore so i wait for it to come out at home but i haven't watched the trailers because i just want to be surprised for once just like just go in blind without 17 trailers and tv spots to watch on youtube like it's almost like it's just too much sometimes. So I'm uh, I'm coming off sounding like a very curmudgeon old man right now. And I'm trying not to, but like, you know, it's just the world's, I'm getting older and the world's changing and I'm trying to, you know, I want to, I want to keep it real. I don't want to go into this world of everything's a Netflix show. You are at the age where this is going to happen to. Aren't you around 30? Aren't you like pretty much? I'll be, uh, I'll be 30 in November. Okay. So that's what I was thinking. I was thinking you're close to 30. Yeah. You're, you're, you're at the age where you are no longer the target market for Hollywood. They don't want your money. They don't care about you. And you're like, and that was a tough one for me. Cause I, I was always, I was in the theater usually three times a week and then buying the discs and like, it was all for me and I was loving it and I didn't think it was ever going to stop. And then I got to that age and I was like, wait a minute, they're rebooting. What? Why would they like, why would they do another take on that? The last one was perfect. We don't need another take on so-and-so or like another transformers movie. Hold on a second. And then uh, you just kind of start to realize like, Oh, this isn't for me anymore. And you see the young people talking about it and they're like, it's the best thing ever. And you, and then we go back to the teenagers. It, it's all for teenagers. 
most of most of what's being made is for teenagers because they're the ones with the disposable income. They don't have babies. They don't have mortgages. They don't have, you know, maybe they have a car payment, but who knows? Um, but, you know, there's it's it's not necessarily a negative thing because that's when you can really turn around and embrace everything that's been off your radar up to that point. And it's, it, you're discovering it. You're discovering Night of the Hunter. You're discovering tentacle tentacle i will hey i'll go and get that because that sounds awesome but but you're totally right it's like um over the last few years it's been like okay well yeah they don't make movies for me anymore but for a hundred years they have been so i i have more than enough to watch but i've got to go into the back catalog and that's where physical media becomes super important to me is because those movies don't those don't usually exist. You, you can't find the night. I don't know where you'd find the night of the hunter, maybe criterion's channel because it's, it's their release, but like where else are you going to find a movie like that? It's, it doesn't exist on your typical streaming platforms. So like, I want to say that's a Fox movie too. I'm going to double check that, but I, I think it, say uh, that. I think it is. I think you're yeah. right. Cause I've got that on a Robert Mitchum box set from Fox and uh, where's that right now? Outside of criterion. Um, it's United Artists, so never mind. Well, that might be distributed by. All right, move away. <laughs> move away. I think Fox is distributing that anyway. Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> but that's like, but that is why I have like I've. I never fell out of love with like my collection and stuff, but it was always much more like let me grab the latest release and build that up, and now yeah. it's become it's almost become more fun to have the collection and like really go shopping for weird movies and like get invested in those. Like I'm, I'm just like so obsessed with like the movies I can't watch. Like those are the ones I want to watch the most. I don't even know if they're good or not. Cause I've never seen them, but like, what do you mean? I want to watch. I saw it today. What is it? The, is it the devils? 1971. There was some horror movie about like a, a nun, um it was like very religious it was a mainstream movie but it's been ripped off of everywhere because of religious you know beliefs and people fighting against it and it looks awesome and i saw it on twitter and i'm like okay where can i buy this i want to watch it tomorrow it's not out there it's not out there it doesn't exist and i'm like damn now you now it makes me want it five times as bad and i'm like determined to find it so I love that little like discovery that I can still have 50 years after that movie came out. Mm-hmm. I'm discovering it on Twitter and like doing a deep dive into how I can watch this movie. Yeah. That, that's, that's what's fun right now. Yeah. That's great. A, f- a collection should be alive. You know, it shouldn't be this dead thing that's just there as a, there's a whole separate topic about collecting just for collecting, but I think that collecting should be a representation of your interests and discovery and it should be alive and you should be excited about it and able to recommend things to people too. You know, is I see so many collecting, I, I'm not calling anybody out, but there's a lot of collecting channels and blogs and social media accounts and they don't ever talk about the stuff. It's just like about this, 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 and this. But I don't know what they thought about it. I don't know if they liked it. I don't know what they're, they don't have any revelations about Robert Mitchum and his cool knuckle tattoos. You know, I don't know. Yeah, no, I feel that. And I, I do actually, I've fallen into that trap a hundred percent, you know, where we're talking about, I'm talking about 4k and I get so caught up in like, okay, how's the transfer? How's the restoration? And like, I'm super interested in that. And like restoration work is really cool, but also like, was the movie any good? Like, was it worth watching? Like I want, I, I, I've gotten this feedback and I need to bring more of that to my channel and to my videos. It, it, it can't just be, yeah, great looking disc, absolute shit movie that nobody should ever watch. Like, yeah. does it make you feel anything or is it, does it just look pretty on the screen? Because to buy something just cause it looks pretty, I understand a demo disc and I understand the purpose of it, but like, ultimately we're not running a best buy here so yeah how many and, demo discs do i need you yeah know? and life's too short to spend yeah. time on things that you're not really enjoying yeah so i definitely I'm, been i've been feeling that shift so cool i think i think the podcast here and, and videos going forward i'm gonna sort of 
shift the way I talk about things, which awesome may surprise some people. It'll be a little different, but you know, 30, 30, I'm getting 30 and flirty, trying something new. So <laughs> <laughs> gotta, you know, gotta go out on a limb and try something different. There you go. That'll be great. <sighs> wow, man, it's been. So these episodes are supposed to be 45 minutes ish. And I knew that ours was not going to be 45 minutes. It flew by though, didn't it? It was, it flew by, but I was like, I really, this, this could be like a three hour episode if we really let it go. It, um, that's true. Yeah. We'll just so have much... to continue it later down the road. Part oh, two. I for sure. will have you back on and we'll, we'll try to maybe, uh, maybe we'll dive into some specifics or something and, like we did before, like maybe talk about a specific topic or a, a we genre, can try, like, decade. We'll try of movies. to stay on a topic. We yeah. can try to stay on topic, but I, I just just talking with you, you know, about movies and stuff is just the best. So I knew I had to have you on as the first guest. I think people are gonna love it. This was a great conversation. I think we yeah, dove yeah. into a lot of stuff. So um, yeah, this was. Yeah, I just, agree. Thank you. Thank you for having. Thank you for asking me. What an honor. And you got to come to. We'll have to have. I'm gonna come back on my channel. We'll have a oh, chat about something there too. But just for keep sure, it, keep going for back sure. and forth. I'll be back on. I'll have you back on for sure. We'll 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 work together because I do. I just love like you've you've got that different take, like you said. Then I talk to a lot of people who collect and a lot of people who are doing reviews, and there are lots of great people out there. Like you said, I'm not knocking anybody, but. I don't know of anybody who has like that, like Quentin Tarantino video store employee, like type knowledge <laughs> that you have when you're talking movies. Like, I don't know of anybody else who would have mentioned an Italian tentacle octopus movie from the seventies. And that's what I love about it. Cause now I have something to go chase down and watch tomorrow. Check out while you're at it, check out the music too. I'm going to, cause the music is the selling point. It's uh, I think his name's Steve Cipriani. Again, I'm going to Google that just to be sure. But, and for everybody that's listening to this or watching this, um, the soundtrack for that thing is amazing. And it's like, uh, I don't even know how you would classify it. And it's like, there's like a new age quality to some of it. There's a there's two killer whales in the movie. Like, why are two killer whales in this movie? And they attack the octopus. Like, spoilers, they attack the octopus at one point. Uh, and you're like, what? They're like this guy's pet. It's the prequel uh, to Orca. <laughs> yes, but they have this uh, like new age whale song music, <laughs> so you can't buy the soundtrack for this movie. So I, I fell down this like gray area of YouTube where I was trying to find just like somebody's rip of the soundtrack, and I did find it. And one of the comments was like, "This movie's terrible, but this music is amazing." And I was like, <laughs> "Yes, it is." Um, Stelvio, uh, Stelvio Cipriani, C I P R A. C I P R I A N I Cipriani. Uh, look up his music for that, and it is so good. This is what, like, I know we're wrapping up. The passion for movies, right? Like, you realize that whether, like, people take dumps all over everything now. You know, I just saw Morbius in the theater. It's not, guys, Morbius isn't great, but there's a whole lot of people talking about Morbius who didn't go see Morbius and they don't really know what they're talking about. Like, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, it's just There's group so many thing. movies out there, and you're like, it's not great, it's not terrible, it's okay. I can find something to connect with for most things. For tentacles, it's the ridiculous. They they pay like a million dollars for this octopus, and then they put it in the water, and it just sinks to the ground, like it doesn't float. And so it's, but that's part of the fun, right? Just the fun of exploring movies, and like, well, that didn't work, but this part really did. Anyway, it's the passion, no, the discovery. Yeah. No, I hear you. It's it's all every, everything's in extremes now. It's either the and it's all recency bias. It's either the best movie you've ever seen yeah. at this very minute, or it's the worst movie that's ever come out until next weekend when the new worst movie that's ever come out comes out. Like, and then that gives people a couple of years later the chance to go back and go like better than you remember or piece of crap that you liked or something like that. You know, you see that. Ha I know. I know it happened really big time with those uh, Disney Star Wars movies. It's like people are like, is it – saw both ends, like better than we thought and like not as good as we thought. And so that's it. Hot take reaction as soon as as soon as something comes out. And then redemption two years later, however – because everybody wants to be the person to poop on it the first time. And then they want to be the person to go like, on second thought, it's all right. It's, it's just for clicks. It's all for clicks.
No, it is. And it's all, I mean, it's always been happening, but it's so bad with, with social media now. It's, it's yeah. sometimes I swear within a month, people are like, oh, wait, no, actually, this movie has some really great redeeming qualities after I trashed it. And it's like, you, you only gave it four weeks. You know, did it really, <laughs> did it change you that quickly? It used to take Big Lebowski like 10 years to develop a cult following. Now yeah. it only takes four weeks. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. We move fast, don't we? Oh, yeah. Well, I appreciate it. I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for, for taking the time. We took a, I took a whole hour of your time here. So much appreciated. I know people are going to love this conversation. And, um, you know, before we, before we sign off, because I don't even know if I ever even introduced you or your channel or anything. So do you want to give people a little shout as to like where to find you and what you're doing? Sure. Uh, you can find me at serialatmidnight.com and on YouTube at youtube.com slash serialatmidnight. I'm also on uh, Twitter and on uh, Instagram and Facebook, all the places that you find. I, and apparently I'm on TikTok too, but I'm not doing much with it. <laughs> but we don't uh, know what the username is because someone stole it. <laughs> yeah, I don't even, it's Serial at Midnight something or other. Uh, it's got numbers on it, so I don't know. But uh, yeah, just if you if you Google me, you'll find me. But serialatmidnight.com is the landing page for all that stuff. All the videos are there, and uh, I write. I try to write. I'm kind of out of the habit right now, but I try to write at least three written reviews every single week for movies, so, which is a very different tone and a, diff a different approach than a YouTube approach. Um, more scholarly, if that's your. Sorry if that's a trigger, but it's you know more intense look, you know more serious look at stuff. Uh, flexing my my critic muscles there but i think that's it i think those are the places where you can find me and again thank you so much this was great i had a blast no Keep anytime and and he's doing it all himself too people so I, I know i'm doing it myself but this guy's doing six to seven videos a week three written reviews like this is why i watch and read his content because i don't even know how you do it i don't know how you keep up if i get two videos out in a week i'm like yeah that was a great week i killed it so props to you for just all the content and it's great stuff and you guys should all go check it out. I'll be honest with you. I don't know how I do it either. I step back some weeks. And I'm like, how do I, it's usually like 12 hour days. Some usually seven days a week. Like I start when I wake up and I'm usually doing it close to bedtime, but I just love it. I mean, I get tired sometimes, but I do love it and I can't, I physically cannot stop. See that documentary Conan O'Brien can't stop. Like, I can't stop. I just, I just <laughs> yep. keep doing it. It's like, I got to talk about it. Hey, it's what you love, right? So it is. Yeah. It's the passion. You can do what you love every day. That's a win. Yeah, that's right. So well said. All right. Thank you, man. I appreciate it.